going to do it. So, all right, guys. Hey, I am super excited to have a good friend, Ben Schmidt, with us uh, on today's Join the Conversation. What's going on, Ben? Hey, how's it going, Steve? Uh, well, we're, this is a great series. So it's called Join the Conversation. And Ben and I kicked it around a couple of weeks ago. We were just talking about how to keep the conversation moving um, with industry thought leaders and technology. And then we talked about amplifying the message. And so it's a partnership uh, with MGIC, which is a phenomenal mortgage insurance company, uh, which Ben helps to lead the digital strategy and has been a thought leader with Loan Officer Hub. Um, and we're partnering with Loan Officer Leadership. Uh, which is a group that we've created uh, that follows the podcast and really building a community where we leave logos and egos at the door to help collaborate and grow together. And so uh, just excited. Uh, two weeks ago, we had Dennis Black on with us and Ben and I got to talking about tech and I'm like, brother, we got to talk more tech because you are a tech genius. And so uh, today that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about uh, easy to use technology uh, to amplify your message and voice, and especially in today's environment when many people are uh, literally having to learn how to work out of home, work out remotely, and do their work completely different than it was just three weeks ago. So, Ben, talk a little bit about uh, your role in technology and some of the things you're using or seeing to help amplify a message and voice. Yeah, I think the key there is easy to use. I mean, really want to focus on things that everybody can take advantage of now and in the future. And in terms of amplifying your message, but also, as you said, your voice. And I, for me, I think brand immediately. How can I amplify the message of what my brand is? Um, so at MGIC, for the background, just uh, working in digital strategy, helping the company across uh, the enterprise with some digital technology, but also then focused on our field folks and ways in which they can help expand their um, digital presence through different outlets. And given the climate of today, I would agree there's a lot of things that we can think about using to help do that. Um, for me, I kind of break it down into where can I find content, right? Step one, finding that type of content. I think last time we talked, I mentioned, you know, one of the basics, Google Alerts. We didn't dive too deeply into it. But for me, I'm thinking, okay, where can I find trusted content that I could share out to my audience across different platforms, whether it be social or if it's through email as the deliverable. And so what I think is important with Google Alerts to note is that a lot of times when I'm talking with loan officers, they're saying, well, I don't have a Gmail email, right? Well, that's not true. You need a Google account tied to any email. So you can tie it to your work email. So it comes in in the morning and you get that list of different uh, types of content based on the queries that you've set up. And what I touched on was, how do you set up those queries? And so it's yeah. Boolean style. And with that, something to keep in mind is the ability to use quotes, you know, the bunny ears, so that you can group multiple terms together, and then also using and or statements, so you can get very granular. And then what I think is really important to pay attention to is uh, geolocation right? So we want what we're sharing to be highly relevant to that select audience that actually cares about what that content is. So getting down to the state level, for example, on a specific topic um, is a great way to approach finding that content that different individuals care about. Hey, so talk about that. So in the Google alerts, there's actually a place where you just, you start to search for the type of info that you're looking for, mm -hmm. and then you group it together and it automatically comes to you in an inbox, or how is that coming to you? Or are you just What's the notification process on that? Yeah, and so you can select, do I want this every day? Do I want this once a week? Do I want everything that Google finds? We know Google's king, so it finds a lot of stuff. Or do we want only the best stuff based on the amount of traffic that that specific blog post, for example, is getting? It's not just written pieces too, which I find really interesting, is you can get into discussion forums that are publicly available and see what people are talking about there. Uh, video is also a part of that as well. So it's lots of different mediums which I think plays nicely. And when you're thinking about what is my marketing mix for the content I want to share on different platforms, because I'm not a proponent of that uh, blanket approach or shotgun approach where it's the same piece of content across all platforms. I like to try and keep it tailored to what I know my audience cares about on Twitter versus LinkedIn versus Facebook uh, versus Instagram. And so I think each platform is unique and it can be the same concept of you're doing X, Y, Z, but different takes, different approaches, different verbiage to make it more appropriate uh, for those folks that follow you there. 
Hey, and I love that. So what, what do you say, like, what kind of content are you looking for now? Cause you're, you're an industry thought leader. You're leading in a, just a huge organization and we've got loan officers, we've got realtors, we've got real estate professionals that are watching. So what type of content are you trying to curate at this time and bring in so that you can sort through it or sift through it quickly and start figuring out where to post and what to post? Yeah, I keep it really broad to start in terms of, I also put competitors on alerts so I know what they're talking about, what they're up to, what's changing in their industry. Whenever they're mentioned, we get a note on that. Um, But I like to look at both what's happening right now and what type of situation we're in. So everyone's pretty much working remote the best that they can. What Mm -hmm. might I care about if I'm new to this? What might I care about if I've been doing this a while? But then also not losing focus about the future. You know, summer's coming up this may pass, things are gonna go back to quote normal. And so then what are people going to be wanting to hear about then? Maybe it's, um, if I'm on Facebook, summer events that are going on, things to do out and about. And so my alerts are very long, um, but in that it's very easy to absorb. You get that alert, you scroll through and you're like, no, this is not appropriate, this is garbage. This is really good though, and this would do well on this platform. So I like to keep it broad, always talking about a little bit of uh, personal interest, a little bit of business, um, yeah. and then pushing it out appropriately. Hey, and then talk about, so g- can you give us an example of something maybe you've looked at this week, and then talk about, you know, it's interesting, you had three points two weeks ago that I loved. You talked about frequency, which we're going to come back to. Then you talked about an appropriate message, and then you talked about the platforms. Mm-hmm. So give us an example of something maybe you curated this week, and you say, this is great information, and here's how I'm thinking about pushing it out on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. So how are you dividing up the content? Yeah, so uh, recently, I guess I suppose an example could be is finding a piece of content related to um, how business is shifting in today's climate and what does that mean for me as a as a business person right and so for LinkedIn that to me is very straightforward that works very well in terms of the network I have on LinkedIn is very business focused Um, whereas when I start to push stuff out on Twitter I might be want to put a little bit of spin on it in terms of it's business focused but uh, it had the caveat of being about how it's not just being remote, but the different technologies that can work with it. And a lot of times before I came to financial services, I had um, stronger computer tech and tech industry is what I was in. And Mm -hmm. so playing up that aspect of that piece of content. So again, if we're going to do the same piece of content, just make sure it's relevant to that audience. So playing up that aspect of it. And then for Facebook, just being more visual with it. uh, I may not even post it on that platform but having a little bit more fun with uh, how I'm approaching it with the people there. Because again, Facebook is probably um, the people that I am connected with there know me for a really long time. They've known me since high school versus the folks on LinkedIn have known me since I became uh, in the industry and, and uh, a less shorter duration. So that's how I kind of approach it. And then looking at whether I include visuals, which hashtags and which hashtags are going to help scale it faster. Hey, so to the ordinary, like how much time are you spending on, on something like that to be a thought leader, to move across multiple platforms? You even said something a couple of weeks, at least start with one you're good at, and mm-hmm. then you kind of branch out. So let's talk to somebody who has, let's say Instagram or no, even just say Facebook and LinkedIn. Like what, what are the things they should be focusing on? How do they continue to grow their influence and impact because they move totally different? Yeah, for me, it's one part being there real time, but then also this is where I kind of get into social schedules or schedulers. And we talked a little bit about that in terms yeah, of keep going. Me, yeah. yeah, I've used Buffer for a really long time um, since they just were a five person company and now they're much larger than that. And what I like about them is it's a low cost or no cost solution integrates with Chrome very well. You have your Chrome extension so you can, as you're surfing the internet, you come across different articles or you're on a different social platform, the ability to, um, sometimes I push it to an app called Pocket. And so Pocket will allow me to keep those saved to read later. uh, And then I can also schedule them out later. But the ability to say, this is something that I think might be interesting and then putting it into um, Buffer in this example. And then you can have your set days and times of which things are posting. 
Um, I find myself doing that in real time, but then also maybe Sunday nights, looking through what I've saved in pocket and scheduling those out on the appropriate platforms uh, based on what I was thinking at the time. What I would say though, is that social is always a two-way street. And in particular, if you're posting out to social media, it's not just push, 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 absorb, uh, but you want to have that dialogue too. And so it's a balance between what is scheduled out and there on a reoccurring basis and what frequency is appropriate for that specific platform. So for me, LinkedIn, what a lot of people don't understand that I work with is that any action that you perform, whether it's a like, a comment, or obviously a share of someone else's uh, post, has the likelihood to uh, show to your valued business connections. Now, not everybody's not seeing everything, just doesn't work like that, but they're gonna probably see about 15 to 20% of what you push out or what action you take. And so keep in mind, if I push out a post, that's considered an action. But if I also, while I'm on there, like three other people's posts in that same time and maybe share someone else's post to stay top of mind, that's a lot of activity in a short period of time. So I try and temper it a little bit more there. Uh, I found that Facebook's starting to trend this way, but it's not full blown like LinkedIn. LinkedIn's always been like that since 2003. And so there you have to be more cautious on frequency. Same with Twitter as well. Um, but then with regard to Facebook and Instagram, you can be a little bit more engaging in a short period of time without having that uh, alienating effect. Hey, so what do you, so go back and go into that in more detail. So in LinkedIn, you're saying the more activity you do in a short frequency of time actually causes less visibility or more? Well, it can inevitably cause more visibility of you and who you are, but there's uh, that, yeah. that fine line of, is this too much or where I'm alienating people and upsetting them and annoying them. I mean, this is what we don't yeah. want to do. We don't want to annoy the people we care about. And so for me, I used to say when I was training on LinkedIn, post once a day, and now I'm saying one to two times a week when I'm training people. And then mm. in addition to that, what I've seen success with is you're only less is more. That's a simple concept. And I think that that can go a long way. But now I'm only posting once or twice a week on really key content that's nice and juicy. But then I go back and revisit that. I might respond to a comment. Well, that counts as engagement. And that plays into my frequency. I might like someone else's post to stay top of mind. Again, when we can't be face to face, uh, making sure that you're supporting the people that you care about in that like or that comment of their post. Uh, whereas Facebook, it's much more, I can do uh, more activity in a shorter period of time without that risk. Got it. Hey, and talk about Pocket. So what a great idea to use something like Buffer uh, that allows you just to pull the article straight out of um, Google into Buffer, but then what is Pocket? Talk about that, um, the app, how does, how does that work? Um, so yeah. clearly it's, it's an indexing of content that you're finding. Yeah, there's a few kind of like this, um, but for me, the, the process is find a piece of content, uh, either put it straight into my Buffer scheduler and be done with it, or put it to Pocket so I can read it later um, mm. and absorb it and then make a decision on that. Um, and then from there, you can push it from pocket to buffer. So that's the steps from, uh, from a process standpoint. But there's others. I mean, Nuzzle I really like as well in terms of Nuzzle's an app where you can connect all of your friends. So like say you're on Twitter or LinkedIn and you can see uh, what are they talking about. But then more importantly, what the friends of those people are talking about. So kind of like that third degree of separation, which helps you better understand what is popular, what's trending, what is the conversation that might be happening within your quote tribe that you might have from a social aspect. And you can find some good nuggets there as well. I think last time we talked, I talked about Flipboard. I've been a huge fan of Flipboard for a very long time, just because of the ability from the user's perspective, like me, if I'm using it to find really niche content that I, that for some reason is very relevant to me, um, but then also what we've found is the ability for our own content to be found there by that key audience and absorb shared uh, traffic. So it helps in driving traffic as well. Um, I mean, the last one I might mention is we talked a little bit is just from a social specific platform, Twitter alerts, um, and that not to forget about that. And so when I'm training on social media, I now have pivoted for a while and said, 
Yeah, I get it because a lot of the pushback I got from folks in this industry is I'm, I'm afraid, I'm concerned, I don't want to say the wrong thing and get sued. I mean, I think that's relevant to every social platform, but for some reason there was the big pushback with regard to Twitter. And I said, listen, guys, you can use Twitter without ever actively tweeting. And it goes back to the simple concept that I find if you're the first to know, you're the first to take action. And so if you're the first to take action, you're the first one to be in front of a referral partner, a customer you're working with just your friends in general. And so with Twitter alerts, it's very straightforward. And, and again, these are simple things that anyone can do right now that you may or may not have heard of, is if you follow a specific person on Twitter, their Twitter handle, whether it's a news a business outlet, news, referral partner, current customer, put a, you follow them and then you can put them on alerts and then you get notified across all devices. So not just mobile, but uh, tablet as well as desktop each time that they tweet. Now, the thing here is just pay attention to frequency as always. People tweet at different frequencies. If you're someone that tweets 20 times a day, that might get annoying and I might not want to deal with that um, and turn off the, the notifications. But the wins here are news in particular. So think about those trusted outlets, whether it's for business or for personal. And then also the referral partners and the customers that you're working with. If they choose to use Twitter as their outlet, you're going to be able to find out that information you might uh, understand otherwise. So it's my wedding anniversary because they're sharing about it. It's my dog's birthday. I think we talked about this a little bit. Okay, go take action. Stay top of mind. Send them dog treats. Send them a handwritten note. You know, you know what's happened and now take that action. And that's what I like about those in particular, the ability to just trigger action. Man, that's, <clears throat> I feel like I'm getting schooled in tech, bro. <laughs> I'm going to have to. But it, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, and, and so it's just another thing to add to your repertoire of how you are staying top of mind when you can't be face to face. Man, that's so good. Hey, and so let, let's talk about platforms. Um, give us a little bit of what your focus is on the platforms that you're looking at. So there's a number of them out there. Um, as a business professional, which ones would say are your top one, two or three? And then also when you're looking at content, you know, I think it's interesting. Facebook uh, when you look at the analytics, you're typically getting less video length views than say maybe YouTube where they're watching more of the video. And it's interesting. I feel like Facebook tends to be more of a billboard. Like everybody's like, oh, great content, but they never watch the full video. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing? And then give us some more clarification on platforms and um, maybe what you would recommend. So we're talking platforms. You mentioned a couple of social ones there in terms of a loan officer. Which one should they prioritize from a time perspective? Yeah, and I think also be focusing on as they're building uh, up their voice and they're working to amplify. Maybe somebody who says, okay, I want to start being a thought leader, putting out great content. Which one or two platforms should I be focusing on? And what does that content look like? Is it video? Is it written? Or is it mm -hmm. shared articles? Is it pictures? Uh, what are you seeing the most traction on? And then after your top two or three, talk about each one of the platforms. Yeah. So my approach for that type of thing is multiple platforms with a single piece of content. And so uh, I'm a big into content creation, you know, I re writing a ton of blogs, a ton of content in that aspect, but mm. it doesn't need to start there. For me, I think it can start with video if you're comfortable. It goes back to what are you comfortable with? And what can you represent yourself um, appropriately and well on? And so I like YouTube simply because of the indexing factor related to Google and how you can help yourself be found by a general consumer audience, as well as business professionals that are looking for how to's on this or how do I um, accomplish this? And just basically look at what am I already having conversations with my customers about face to face? And that should just be the blueprint for the different videos you're going to go out and create and then create them in a way that you're titling them appropriately for indexing. You're getting the descriptions, the hashtagings in there, all the things you need to be doing each time you do a video and you put it out there. Now, whether that's where you drive traffic to, or if you repackage it, you know, take that audio from that video clip and turn it into a podcast. That's a very simple way to get on to voice marketing with uh, flash briefings as well you know chop down that podcast that you've done into two minute tidbits of the best stuff you know the best section of that video where it's most informative this was a really good nugget cut that out that two minute that one minute thing put that into a flash briefing now you're visible on that platform as well 
In addition to that, you know, looking at, okay, well, we did a video talking about X, Y, Z. I can easily write a blog post that builds on that. So that written piece for indexing purposes. And then within that, I'm not going to give you everything. I'll give you 80%. And if you want that 20%, do a webinar. And that's your call to action on the blog. So it's, to me, it's a big web of how can I take a single idea that's really valuable to somebody and put it on the different mediums because not everybody's on YouTube, not everybody's on Facebook, not everybody's on LinkedIn, not everybody's listening to podcasts. But if I get and stumble across that nugget and then uh, that I can absorb it there and that's a positive experience. So that's how I like to approach it in terms of different platforms. And, you know, obviously what I've seen is a spike in Facebook lives recently. It's like, you know, COVID has really pushed you to the point of now's the time to execute. And I've seen so many people that were dormant for so long and now we're all doing flash or I mean, um, Facebook lives. And, and that's yeah. great. I think, you know, there's that learning curve that occurs and they're only going to get better, but it's been around for a really long time. Uh, I'd say the most recent thing that I'm seeing a, an increase in and we're exploring with is virtual reality. I mean, again, we were writing pieces in 2016 on how you could do virtual reality listings for your customers so that they don't have to actually tour the home. You know, my wife and I were like, yeah, that'd be great. I'd like to throw on an Oculus headset and tour a home and make a decision there that goes beyond just still pictures. And so it's finding, I think, as we progress in the, in the coming months and years, you're going to see what has happened here in the last month really play into how things evolve going forward. Uh, within this industry and other industries. Yeah, I love that. Hey, and I think I don't, you know, as a I'm a more of a big picture type processor. And what I loved about what you just said is start with what you're most comfortable with. Like for me, it's probably video, mm -hmm. and then from video, taking the video, stripping the audio, and moving it to the podcast, yep. and then from there, going into a blog, into a call to action. Which what a great nugget that really everything should be driving to one thing. But in today's environment, you could take something you put together on Sunday with a call to action for the next week. If you're breaking the content up enough. Yeah, exactly. you know, I think Ben, the challenge is I've, I've thought it was more content solves problems, but really what I'm hearing you say, which is help helping me with my perspective is not really more content. It's how you take the content you've created and break it up into bite sized segments. Yeah. In addition to that, I would say focus on what am I talking about that's relevant to my key audience. I mean, we have a blog on uh, LO Hub that when we wrote it, um, started to gain traction because we always write for SEO. Um, it came out of an idea, an idea for from a video, uh, which never came to fruition. I mean, this was a few years ago. But that blog now, uh, on an annual basis, I checked the analytics, is at 80,000 views a year, uh, which is pretty pretty high <laughs> That's uh, great. i mean it's garnering quite a few views each month and it's all organic yeah. i mean lo yeah. hub has really been built on organic uh traffic which is always tied back to why are you writing something what do you want it to index for and what kind of value are you going to bring to the table um, mm. so i think all that needs to be thought about in the ideation process so that you can have that best product put out um going forward Hey, so when you're writing for SEO, give me an example. Um, so this, this particular article that y'all have, and man, that's a massive amount of page views um, over the course of a year, especially on something sitting idle. You know, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, we don't, that, we don't promote it at all. <laughs> that's amazing. So like, okay, so if, if I'm thinking about content and I'm thinking about writing for SEO, what does that mean? Yeah, there, there's a fairly straightforward formula you can do for a baseline. Um, and so... For me, I look at, I do a little bit of recon. I look at, I do Google, Google queries and, uh, around that, that key phrase that I want to rank for. And I see what kind of traction is it already getting? How competitive is it? Um, and then I basically write for as if I'm writing to a computer, because you are. And so being conscious of stop words within the key <laughs> components. So how would a computer analyze what I'm writing and then index it? Um, and so... The big thing, I mean, if we want to talk about like the specifics, the, the title of your piece is very important. No stop yeah. words, no ands, no a's, no um, all those. Hey, what's a stop words. word? What do you, what do you, what's a stop word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a stop word is Google sees that and stops indexing. Okay. Or so give me an example of some of them. Yeah. And is the biggest one. So if you're okay. um, so if you're writing a piece 
And I was struggling with this last night when I was thinking about, I'm, I'm redoing stuff on Loan Officer Hub, and I was like, well, I want to index for this word and this word, but I can't use and. So how can I creatively <laughs> merge those two <laughs> words together so that Google will uh, index both equally? And so- What'd you come up with? I have not yet. <laughs> okay. But oh, I think gosh. I'm just going to prioritize one over the other and then play it up later on. So, I mean, you, the, the title of your piece is very important, the H1, yeah. uh, which is, um, which is uh, it's um, backside of a web page. You have an H1, an H2, H3, and they're weighted differently. So making sure that you know your key phrase in the title and then also repeating the h1 the opening sentence uh the opening yeah. paragraph sentence needs to have that same exact uh structure as well what a lot of people forget about i think is imagery so the name of your source file that you upload to a cms for example if that's what you're using for your blog needs to also include that key phrase as well as the alt tags that you have related to mm -hmm. that image on there so there's just a lot of simple things that you need to keep doing uh, repeating the key phrases using variants of that key phrase within the piece for a certain number of times having a specific length all that's just a baseline of best practice for writing for seo and then there's other things you can do as well uh, hey i hope you got this stuff in in uh you you should totally create online courses around this man <laughs> it's so i'm good. pretty sure there's a lot of them out there <laughs> well i get it Hey, uh, okay, so you're uh, you're getting organically found SEO. The the blogs are being optimized through SEO. Um, what are some of the other things you're doing? Like, are there any other good, easy to use technology apps that are helping well, you? What I would say is, while we're still talking about blogging, a, a yeah. lot of people would say when I was training um, f folks in the industry, well, I don't know how to do a CMS. I don't know WordPress. Uh, you know, things like that. How can I blog? Well, I think people forget about Medium. So medium.com is a great outlet for you to write your blogs where, and then it's publicly found by anybody. It indexes quite well. Um, and that's an opportunity for you to take a no cost solution, write your thoughts down, share them out. Uh, LinkedIn pulse, you know, for a while there was a hiccup where they stopped doing it. They brought it back. Um, some of the ones that I wrote uh, on LinkedIn pulse years ago, were got a lot of visibility and there's other ways to scale that so there's specific groups you could think about sharing that new linkedin pulse article um, in to help gain traction and awareness so you don't need to know how to run a cms a, a, a content management system in order to have a blog sometimes i think people believe that they have to know how to use wordpress or something similar to start a blog but you know simple things like medium are out there and available and do really well in indexing yeah. Hey, and let me ask you this. How are you getting more exposure on LinkedIn? You know, one of the things that I looked at the other day, it, you can have a ton of connections. And then when you're posting videos or when you're sharing content, it doesn't seem like it's getting a lot of traction. What are you doing to get more traction in LinkedIn? Well, Let's I would say, say you've got an article yep. you want to share. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. How do you get more eyeballs on it? Because, I mean, let me give you an example. So for mine, I've got, I don't know, there's thousands of people that are supposedly connected. But then if I'm sharing content or I'm typing content or I'm sharing an article or maybe throw up a video, I don't feel like it's getting as much traction as it could. And yeah. I'm seeing other people do videos and they're getting thousands of, you know, interactions. How are you increasing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, and I think everybody's different, everybody has a different network, but for me, the formula that I like to follow, and also I would say this is timely because I have seen an algorithm shift in the last nine months now with what kind of content does well versus what doesn't. Um, so to answer your question, what I have seen a spike in, in terms of visibility is this, and you may have seen them. Um, so it's basically, if I want to share something out, what we did is we created a, a, a selection of what we call LinkedIn shareables. And it's around topics that are of value, like 15 greater than 20 or readiness, which is a consumer site, um, and a few others. So we created those, but what we did is we created them as PPTs and we made them really obnoxious. We made them vertical, so they're long. Uh, they're not like the standard size. Yeah. And so you can't miss it. But then I think more than that is it was easy to absorb, stat filled, and we, I said, let's just keep it to five slides, only five slides. And then we use the document upload option. This is LinkedIn we're talking document upload option, which I think had been neglected for a while, which is why maybe it's getting an algorithm boost. Um, and we posted it there. And it's really slick on mobile. It's just the side swipe. You can easy to absorb. 
Um, so having a call to action in the copy to tee it up, using a different type of medium to push it out. So using the document upload, you can upload the PPT. If someone wants to download it, it downloads as a PDF, but you could also upload a PDF of it as well. And then for me, I always try and get the uh, most amount of people involved in the success of it. So for me, the more people you can raise awareness with on a piece that are going to care about it, that are going to support it most importantly. So getting that engagement from other people that have larger networks is going to help you scale that piece faster. And what we saw is on average, I mean, for me, I pushed out a couple and within a couple of days, it was over 5,500 views, which I thought was quite a bit given my network um, is larger now, but compared to some of the other posts, it was not getting that kind of visibility in that short of time. So we kind of scaled it that way. Um, hey, you did that. I saw you do that with you really your connection, even within MGIC, it's tagging like it, it felt like the more you're getting people connected to that piece, they're sharing it and it just keeps growing in its amplification on the message. Yeah. So me, I always talk about that's a baseline of success. If you're going to post it out, you need to do these things just as best practice. But then what we've also incorporated is, and we've been doing this for a couple of years now, in leveraging our internal brand advocates. I think that cannot be overlooked. So if you're looking, if you're working at a company, you all work at the same company, you all share the same values, you all are invested in the success of the company. And so you should support one another. And so we use a third party application which allows us to send out, I used to do this by email. So I would write an email out into different folks within our company and say, hey, check out this post or this post or you know, this is out here and it would point them to the different social platforms. Well, now we use a third party service that does that and allows people to just know internally what we're talking about, what we yeah. have to say, who we might want to support. Uh, and we run that always in the background as well as a way for our internal brand advocates to know most importantly what we're saying because you can't be everywhere at once. I mean, this goes back to minimum time, maximum value. Where is my time best spent to see a return on that? And that's what we want everyone that works for MGIC to know is your time is very valuable. And anyone yeah. watching this, your time is valuable. And so where can I focus to, um, that makes sense for me to help um, post something out, whether it's content related or to support somebody else. Man, that's great. Hey, and I do want to acknowledge, hey, Jeff, Zimfer is on, Jennifer Hernandez. Hey, Jeff. Uh, Zane, hey, Jen. we got some great people. Uh, Trudy, it's great to see everybody, uh, especially on the Facebook Live. If y'all got any questions, uh, make sure to send them. Uh, I'm with a good friend, uh, Ben Schmidt with MGIC, and he's really uh, just a genius when it comes to technology. Hey, and Ben, so we've talked about things like Pocket, which in the show notes, we'll go back and add some of the apps. Uh, we talked about Nuzzle. Uh, we've talked about using Buffer and curating content straight out of Google, uh, which allows you to, to really go through a lot of content and then decide which platforms you're going to put it on. Uh, what are some of the other easy to use tech that helps people uh, get the message out? Is there anything else that comes top of mind? Uh, I mean, there's a lot. So I think, you know, for me, I'm very visual, visually focused. And I think a lot of us are short attention spans, don't have a lot of time for stuff. So we <laughs> need something sure. that pops in our face. You know, that's why I think video is still so successful is we're naturally lazy. We don't want to read. So let me just watch this video on mute with captions for the next minute. And I'm okay with that. I don't want my time back. I don't want my click back. Um, but for me, I've always talked about with customers Canva. It's been around again for a long time. And it's evolved in a really nice way where you can make really high quality graphics that you can share. So say your marketing team isn't that large or you're just off the cuff, you want to create something that allows you to do that. They've gotten into animated social posts as well, which I think are attention grabbing. And so this easy ability to create something a little bit different, a little bit better than if you didn't have that to work from uh, is a nice way to go about it. Um, from a video aspect, I like Animoto. Uh, so it allows you to create fairly high quality videos in my opinion and with minimal effort put behind it. Um, and then I think we talked last time about uh, Loom. I use Loom all the time. I did that for my video post on a LinkedIn hack that I had that I thought made sense to share out. Again, it wasn't really business related and that's where I think you need to think about your marketing mix. I'm not promoting any specific business or an aspect of those business. It's just for me, I found this really valuable. So I want to share this out to you guys as well because maybe it'll be valuable to you as well. Um, 
And then again, if we're talking easy to use stuff, I like InShot and also very simple Apple Clips. Uh, I think people forget about that. But if you're looking for captioning software that's fairly good, as well as the ability to do the videos, the stickers, all that stuff, Apple yeah. Clips that comes natively in there at no cost. And Headliner, Headliner app I've been using a lot lately as well. Um, Man, I think if you just take a little bit of time and explore some of those things, uh, especially Headliner for captioning as well, because that's the biggest question I get is I've created this video, but how do I do the captions in an easy way? Um, and so the ability to upload a vid, um, to upload that audio or that video clip to Headliner, it auto captions and it does a pretty good job. Yeah. Hey, and what are you seeing as far as mix? Talk about that. You, you, a couple of weeks ago, you talked about how much should be business, how much should be personal, how much should be other um, across all the platforms. What's your rule of thumb? I think, um, yeah. go ahead. There's a golden rule out there. There's a lot of them, but one was like the 60 what was it 60 30 10 that comes out yeah. to 100 <laughs> <laughs> i hope so <laughs> and essentially 60 percent is not your own content it's curated content which you would yeah. think again social if that's your medium is a two-way street so how are you supporting your referral partners or other people in the industry your customers and what they're saying and curating that content and sharing that out as a support mechanism um, as well as just general news, that's where Google Alerts comes in. So a lot of it is just what's happening in the industry, what's relevant to my audience, that's 60%. 30% is content from your own website that might be of value, maybe aspects around home ownership. You know, we're not big fans of direct selling anything. We don't want a commercial for anything. It's how does this add value to what you're doing for job X, Y, Z? And that's what we want to create without that um, hard sell. And then 10% is that promotional post. You know, if you need assistance with this, DM me. Um, here's my phone number. Here's my email. Reach out. But again, everyone pretty much will on their own figure out who you are and what you do. And so you don't need to do that hard sell all the time. Or if it's like highlighting, I got a great five-star review, you know, temper that, but still do it. It just shouldn't be 60% of what you're posting out there. And to that point, I would add, I don't think we talked about these last time, but I talk about them when I'm training sometimes is um, that same concept for the Nextdoor app. And I know Nextdoor app, we're kind of getting away from content creation or anything like that. But if we're talking about amplifying your voice or your message, an example I always like to use is Nextdoor app. Most people have heard of it. I brought it to my neighborhood. It's very micro down to the neighborhoods, not just zip code, but neighborhood. And the way that I approach this with myself and loan officers and, and real estate agents as well is that it's, um, if you're on there, what you see is a lot of cats and dogs run away and miraculously a lot of them are found <laughs> through the app, which is great. I've experienced that myself. And then, but more importantly is you all live in the same neighborhood for a reason and people yeah. trust those people in your neighborhood. So they're asking for recommendations. I need painter, plumber, Tuck pointing, construction, real estate, who do you, Mr. Mrs. Neighbor that I trust recommend? And so Nextdoor apps evolved a ton since the beginning. So you can do paid advertising and you can you know, stand on your soapbox and talk about how great you are, come do business with me. I think everyone looks right past that. But what I like to do is, and these are real life stories, is my wife said, hey, let's paint the downstairs. And I said, well, the downstairs looks great. It doesn't need painting. But I went on the Nextdoor app, I said, hey guys, who do you recommend for a painter um, that's in our area, right? So community, because we trust community, neighbors, because we trust our neighbors. And a bunch of people wrote back, which was great. But before I took anybody up on their recommendations, I looked at who was recommending that person. So depending on how open you are, I could see that you're a loan officer, that you work around the corner, that um, you, know, you have interests in world travel or whatever it is. So I can see that, I can see where you live if you keep that open. Point is, is that then I know what you do as a business professional and that recommendation I took you up on is the best recommendation I've ever had, you know, and this is the case. Like my wife loves the walls in the other room, comments them on the day. And this was three or four years ago. I'm like, great. And I remember exactly who gave me that recommendation and I send him business and I give him my own business. It's this idea of, you know, you don't need to directly sell to somebody to, in order to get that, those indirect sales flowing through. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're thinking about what other apps could I help drive business and messaging for my brand um, that aren't those traditional ones. Hey, I man, and I think that's so good. I, I think so many times we look past our sphere of influence, trying to influence others outside of it. 
not realizing the most effective, the most the most effective area that we have is what's closest to us, man. That's great. Hey, talk to us. Uh, what are some of the other things? Anything else you want to share, or does anybody else who's watching maybe have a question about technology and how to amplify your voice? Uh, whether you're a loan officer, a realtor in the real estate space, or even business space, we'd love to have Ben answer it. Uh, any other closing thoughts you have? Yeah, I could share a couple more. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think what well, if while we wait for people to write stuff in, if they're going to write anything in, is um, I like to take, you know, apps that are familiar as well. So Zillow, for example, everyone knows Zillow, whether they like them or not. What I like is the way that I feel loan officers could leverage this is on Zillow, you have what's called make me move. And so again, real life stories that are just applicable. My wife, you know, last year, I think was like, Hey, I want to move. And I said, well, I like her house. Why do you want to move? <laughs> And she said, I don't know, I want to move. I was like, all right, well, we're going to move on my terms. And so I claimed my property on Zillow. I listed it as make me move. And I listed it 80 grand above what any normal person would pay and put it out there. And I was like, haha, nobody's going to take me up on this. And then within like six hours, I had seven real estate agents and three private buyers. And the real estate agents that contacted me were contacting on behalf of their private buyer because they had no idea what make me move was. But they're like, my client said that they saw a post for make me move. So essentially it blew up and, and everyone wanted to see the house. So they don't care what the price is. Now we lived in a really hot market at the time and we still do live in a hot neighborhood. But my point that I bring up is no loan officers contacted me. So if you know about make me move, the idea is that I can Great sell idea. the house on my own, but I might need a real estate attorney or somebody to do the paperwork. And if you're a loan officer and you know that person, even though I may not do business with you, I could refer you business, but if you can give me a name of a really great real estate attorney to get the paperwork done, or if you yourself could do it, that's what I think would be really valuable in building that relationship and getting referral business from me because I'm happy now. And it's very um, micro down to the zip code. So, you, you know, again, it's this idea, you set it up once and then take action when needed. So you go onto Zillow, you set up an alert for a specific zip code for make me move properties or for sale by owner properties, and then you just leave it alone. And then when you get an alert on your phone that says, hey, somebody's listed a new property on Make Me Move, you know what action to take. I mean, the same with for sale by owners, if you want to go that route, even though there's real estate agents listing, you could say, hey, uh, you know, it's great, great that you're not using a real estate agent. But if somebody needs to get pre-approved, you know, make sure they are so the deal doesn't fall through. And then if that person says, well, what's a pre-approval? Oh, well, you need a pre-approval. Here's what it is. You know, a branded flyer you could give them or send them to me. I'm in your neighborhood. I'm in your community. It's again, it's granular zip code. It's a nice way to build that relationship. And you can do the same thing if you're supporting and working with real estate agents as well. That's great. So make me move on Zillow. Great tool. Anything else? Any last ones? Uh, last one I'd say is if this, then that. So I get, That's I an like, app? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if this, then, then that. that. Okay. I, -T -T -T. Uh, I like to streamline my life. Again, we're all busy. So you set it up once and then it just runs. Essentially, it goes back to what we've talked about today. First to know, first to take action. So it essentially takes the function of two apps to create a desired recipe or they call it an applet now. Uh, and so you can be micro or macro with it. And so it could be very business focused or at the macro level, what's going on within the industry. And you have different companies that have API integrations like New York Times, financial section, BuzzFeed, et cetera. There's a lot of them. If something starts to trend or is labeled breaking news, let me know. That's the recipe. And then it's like, well, how do you want to get known? Well, do send me an SMS text or send me an email. Again, very broad, but again, first to know, first to take action. I used to have mm -hmm. one on there that was uh, every time I leave work, text my wife, I'm in route because I was sick of typing it every day to let her know I was leaving work because I used, used geolocation based on your device. And then I started leaving work in the middle of the day and she's like, hey, where are you going? What are you doing? <laughs> Turn that, that one off. But um, again, this idea, and there's so many different things you can do with it, especially now with smart technology um, for your home. Uh, it's a fun yeah. one to check out. Man, that's great. Well, and here's what we'll do to everybody who's tuned in um, and on the podcast. Uh, we're going to have you guys a resource list. There's so many apps that Ben's been talking about. And so first off, I want to just say thank you uh, for what you do in this industry and thank, uh, you know, we're so thrilled to be a strategic partner with MGIC and, and everything you're doing lo with Loan Officer Hub. Uh, you've done a tremendous job 
curating and building a site that is full of uh, relevant and helpful and strategic information for the real estate and mortgage community. And so, Ben, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, thank you for being a part of this, man. I appreciate the invite. And uh, yeah, hopefully there's some nuggets in there for you to take away. But if you come up with some other questions, just reach out. Yeah, we'd love to do that. And stay connected to us. Uh, also, you can join the Facebook group, uh, Loan Officer Leadership. We've got great conversations that are happening there. And as we end each and every week, we just want to remind you that anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Just get started. So when tech's overwhelming, when some of these apps seem like there's a lot coming at you, just get started in helping to amplify your voice and your message. And so thank you all for being a part of it. And uh, we'll see you on the next one.